Tony. Yep, you guys ready? Yeah, let's get started. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Thank you for coming uh, today to our show, um, you know, regarding the Clean Water Council's uh, public hearing. It says 2020, we're a little bit late on getting this out. It's 2021, but you know, with all the issues that have been happening, uh, this was the best time to get this thing going. On your screen, you can see uh, the Clean Water Council and what our topic is. All right, our topic today, as you can see, is permitting of PFAS compounds uh, in DEP, uh, New Jersey's discharges in surface waters. Um, you know, our council, we've been in business for a number of years now. Uh, every year we have a topic that's important to the DEP that they would like to have uh, information on in their determinations on how to present to the state their regulatory functions. Um, you know, we, we have a good turnout each year, and I thank all the folks that, that showed up today. Uh, this obviously is, is an interesting topic that affects a lot of folks. You can see from the questions, if you've seen the, um, you know, the announcement, which I imagine you have, you can see the, uh, the listing of questions that we have. And we like to try to keep focused on these questions because these are the items that matter to the DEP the most in their considerations and coming out with their regulatory function. So again, the department is currently requiring sampling for specific dischargers. How should the department extend, expand and prioritize efforts to establish and monitoring requirements for other dischargers you know, regarding PFAS? Since publicly owned treatment works are designed only to treat sanitary waste, should there be a short period of time to focus on the identification elimination of the sources through a track down method before compelling treatment at a treatment facility? If so, what's that period of time? If a track down approach is taken, what information should be collected to identify priority dischargers, specific agents, industries, what they may use in their processes? What specific technologies are potentially available to treat wastewater from large sanitary dischargers for PFAS removal? For these technologies, what is the most effective and cost-effective way of doing this and what secondary impacts, such as residuals management, air emissions, and et cetera, result from their use? Until limits are established at the treatment plant, are there factors that should be considered in the management and the generation of sludge and land application of biosilids? So these are the questions that our council has been posed with by the department to get answers to. And, you know, obviously this is gonna affect all of us. So it, it's a question of providing guidance, recommendations, comments, and how those agencies, departments, and, you know, discharges that are gonna be affected, how they can offer comments and considerations for the department in rulemaking. So it's, it's a very important topic. Um, all right, my name, as I mentioned before, is Anthony McCracken Sr. I, a longtime member of the Clean Water Council and currently chair of the Clean Water Council. Uh, my profession is that I'm the assistant planning director for the Somerset County Planning Division. Uh, also, we have an executive committee made up of uh, myself and a couple others. And if I could ask the council members to, um, you know, put on their, their video so that we could see them and give us a wave. But our executive committee is made up of myself, of course. Jim Cosgrove, are you here? Yes, I'm here, Tony. All right. Also, we have Russ Fanari. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Uh, also, of our committee members, we have Sandra Howland. Mark Widiak, Marianne Holden, Maria Connolly, 
Vincent Monaco, David Kavach, Amy Goldsmith, Pamela Goodwin, George Bacham, Harry Wozunk, and Ashley Kerr. All right, so with that, again, we're seeking testimony on expanding the permitting of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances and discharges to surface water. We're um, soliciting testimony today focused on how to address the presence of PFAS and dischargers in surface water, both direct and indirect, and the management of applications of biosolids that may contain PFAS. If you wish to testify, please put your name and organization in the chat. All right. So with that, we are going to hear from our acting DEP commissioner, Sean LaTourette, Virginia Wong from the US EPA Region 2, Meg Parrish from Parrish from and Yoji Nunes from the state of Colorado. They're going to show us some of the issues that they're dealing with and how they dealt with it. And if you have any questions, you know, again, please place them in the chat and the speakers will attend to the questions if there's time or there's email information available uh, to provide some follow up, you know, for after the hearing. All right. So with that, we're excited to have the DEP newly announced as of uh, January the 16th, I think, Acting Commissioner Sean LaTourette with us today. Um, Mr. LaTourette began serving as Acting Commissioner, as I said, just a few days ago, and he's responsible for formulating statewide environmental policy while directing programs that protect public health and ensure the quality of New Jersey's air, land, water, and natural and historic resources. Sean has 20 years of ex environmental experience, mostly most recently as Deputy Commissioner and Chief of Staff, and earlier as the Chief Legal and Regulatory Advisor at the DEP before being named Acting Commissioner. Since 2019, he's led efforts to craft the reforms necessary to advance the Murphy Administration's climate change and environmental justice priorities. Before entering public service, he specialized in protecting the rights of victims of toxic injuries while also uh, advising infrastructure, transportation, energy, and other industries on compliance with state and federal environmental laws and policies. He began his legal career organizing and defending New Jersey communities whose drinking water was contaminated by petrochemicals. A devoted advocate for equality of all people, Acting Commissioner Latourette served as chair of the LGBTQ rights section of the New Jersey State Bar Association until completing its term this past year, 2020. A New Jersey native, he graduated mega cum laude from Rutgers University and earned his law degree semi cum laude from Rutgers Law School, where he was the class salutatorian and the recipient of multiple environmental and guidance awards and published scholarship on environmental law, natural resources, and climate change. So with that, thank you very much for being here today, um, Acting Commissioner LaTourette, and if you would please introduce yourself and give us your presentation. Thank you, Tony, for, for that introduction uh, and to the council for inviting me here today to share some updates uh, on the DEP's work on, on perfluoroalkyl substances. I'd like to thank the council members, our incredible DEP staff, especially the staff in Water Resources Management in the Division of Science and Research, and our colleagues from the EPA and the state of Colorado for organizing uh, this event and participating today. Most importantly, I wanted to share that I'm grateful for all the participants here today who are taking the time to listen and to engage with us and participate by offering testimony during this hearing on the important questions that we've posed to the council. Let's talk a bit about New Jersey's comprehensive approach to protecting public health and the environment against PFAS. We know that New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the country. 
the seat of historic and current industrialization, and with such a large, dense population and a long history of managing the some of the externalities of some of the world's most historic and, and even current environmental ills, we are uniquely attuned here in this state to the public health threats from naturally occurring and synthetic chemicals, PFAS chief among them these days. Given that the manufacture, use, and disposal of PFAS has occurred throughout New Jersey, our state is in many ways ground zero for dealing with the nation's PFAS problem. And we take that threat incredibly seriously. And it's why we've positioned ourselves as a national leader on the issue. In short, PFAS chemicals are harmful and widespread in the Garden State. As all those uh, here today likely know, that PFAS is an umbrella term for a larger group of several thousand uh, synthetic compounds, PFNA, PFOA, PFOS among them are the most well studied, uh, in addition to Gen X, which is the replacement chemical for PFOA in particular. What lends to the threat of these chemicals and why New Jersey has been tip of the spear on this issue is that they're highly persistent in our environment. They don't break down or biodegrade. They don't occur. They don't occur naturally, and research suggests they pose health risks. Among them, risks even at low exposure to developing fetuses and infants that could last a lifetime, and certain types of cancers, including testicular and kidney cancer. And animal studies of these chemicals have shown a variety of toxic effects to the liver, to the immune system, to the endocrine system, and to the male reproductive system. Other possible impacts have include increased levels of cholesterol, liver enzymes, decreased response to vaccination, higher incidence of childhood infections and low birth weights. And based on research from the CDC, some of these chemicals are found in the blood of virtually everyone in the country. Drinking water is a potential source of exposure to these chemicals given their ability to spread farther and farther through the environment given the, uh, the, the lower likelihood of biodegradation. We also know that PFAS builds up in living tissue. And as a result, people exposed to these substances through drinking water or other means accumulate increasing concentrations in their bodies. So what is New Jersey doing? Well, to assess the level of public health risk from PFAS contamination, we called upon the expertise of New Jersey's Drinking Water Quality Institute. The Institute's members, as many of you know and some of you participate in, are independent scientists, drinking water experts, as well as toxicologists, scientists from the DEP and the Department of Health. And we also have consulted over the years with the US and the US EPA. And as a result of all of the research that we conducted and participate in, always the basis of our efforts, the state adopted groundwater quality standards and MCLs for drinking water. On September 4th, 2018, the first MCL for PFNA was enacted at 13 parts per billion. Then in June of this past year, MCLs for groundwater standards were set at 14 parts per trillion for PFOA and 13 parts per trillion for PFOS. The 2018 action made New Jersey the first state to establish a Safe Drinking Water Act, a maximum contaminant level for PFAS. Currently, there are no corresponding federal standards for PFAS. The EPA has initiated the steps to evaluate the need for an MCL, the need for an MCL for PFOA and PFAS under the regulatory determination process. But in New Jersey, we have not waited to protect public health. We've had, we, and, and that is an owing to the proud tradition in this state of exceeding the floor set by the federal government when it comes to protective standards across the board. And the limitations that we've established are indeed necessary to protect public health, including vulnerable populations that, that we know can often be disproportionately impacted by contaminants of all sorts. In addition to setting drinking water standards, we've also begun issuing NGIPTI's discharge to groundwater permits that require monitoring for PFAS at various facilities. If a facility detects PFAS in its discharge, it's expected to track down and eliminate that source. Beyond our regulatory efforts, we've continued to make strides in protecting public health through enforcement and where necessary litigation, though that is of course always a last resort, to ensure that those responsible for impacts to our environment are remaining fully accountable. 
taking every step necessary to remediate the impacts caused and helping our environment to recover from the harm. Legal efforts to curb New Jersey's PFAS problem date back to the early days of the Murphy administration when the state set about to more aggressively pursue manufacturers responsible for PFAS products. In 2019 and 2020, the state filed several legal actions after trying to reach uh, a more protective result through agency directives and, and amicable discussions. And our efforts to ensure accountability aren't limited to specialty chemical manufacturers. Just last week, the state filed a suit against the federal government, charging that it's contaminated drinking water supplies with PFAS uh, on and around some of New Jersey's military bases through the use of AFFF firefighting foam. So what's next? With, with all of these efforts, you, you might ask yourselves, why are, why are we even here? New Jersey is doing so much, and we are. But given the water cycle itself, we must ask ourselves, where, how, and when should we go further to make sure that we are taking every measure appropriate to protecting public health? So this council's work is an important part of our collective efforts in that respect. We've already come a significant way because we're regulating these chemicals in groundwater and drinking water. And now we must evaluate how we should approach and potentially regulate surface water impacts. We want to continue to seek more effective ways to, ways to further protect our waters. And we're focused on expanding our permitting of direct and indirect discharges of these chemicals. The information we receive today, yours, the council's, is vital to that work. And it's so important that we hear the perspectives of those who've signed up to speak today and may want to submit comments on this issue. The area of focus in today's hearing, discharges to surface water and sludge management associated with these chemicals are important to our current efforts and to build our overall strategy for addressing these substances. We've prided ourselves here at DEP over the course of decades and many administrations on not accepting the status quo when it comes to protecting the health and well being of our people and maintaining a vibrant natural environment. So, this too is an, an opportunity for us to come together, to show our reversibleness, to reach reasonable science-based positions that we can all take pride in bringing before the public to show them that across government, across industry, and across public works, that we are all committed to that preservationist principle and protecting public health. So I look forward to hearing today's presentations, and I thank our colleagues in sister states and at EPA. Thank you to the council, to our incredible staff, and I look forward to all the comments that will be shared. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much for your, your comments and uh, look forward uh, to seeing you in the future. And thank you so much for um, you know, those, those things you said and how we can participate in this process. And also good luck to you in um, you know, your new position and look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is, an, it is credible work uh, that we get to do here uh, and we only do it together with all of our constituencies. So thanks again. Absolutely, for sure. All right, our next speaker will be Virginia Wong who is the Chief of Water Permits Program in the Water Division of US EPA Region 2. Region 2 covers New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. Ms. Wong directs and manages the permitting aspects of National Pollution Discharge Elimination System programs for municipal industrial facilities, including direct and indirect dischargers, stormwater, combined sewer overflows, and pretreatment. Ms. Wong has over 30 years of experience in wastewater management, industrial waste pretreatment, the GIPTES permits, and enforcement programs. Uh, Ms. Wong uh, will be setting up her materials for her presentation. I believe we're all set with that. 
Yes, and I just want to remind people to um, remain on mute and turn off your cameras um, and that way we can see the speaker appropriately. So thank you. As soon as I see Virginia, I will make sure she's up and ready to go. Thanks. Let me, while I have a second, let me also just bring attention to three very important people in all of this. And that's Janice Brogel, Jennifer Feltis, and also John Gray, who are support to the Clean Water Council. They've brought amazing um, abilities and help to us and, uh, you know, are able to pull this conference off given, you know, the fact that we're dealing, you know, visually with everything, but also the fact that they've um, just helped us along the way with our council meetings, organization and such. So, you know, a big shout out to them. Thank you again. Hi. Okay. Got it. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all for the introduction. Um, I want to thank New Jersey Clean Water Council for the uh, opportunity to present today. Um, my presentation today will focus on EPA's uh, interim strategy for per and polyfluoro alkyl substance, PFAS, in federal issued National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit, also known as the NPDES permit system. Um, I will begin with a brief background on PFAS, EPA's action plan to address PFAS, the need for PFAS NPDES permitting strategy, the development and the finalization of the strategy. Per and polyfluoro alkyl substance, PFAS, PFAS, um, are a group of man-made chemicals that have been in use since the 1940s by a variety of industries and in consumer products. Exposure to PFAS can accumulate and remain in the human body for a long period of time. And there's evidence that exposure to certain PFAS may lead to adverse human health and environmental effects. There are two specific PFAS chemicals that, um, um, that are shown here. They are characterized by the long, strong carbon fluorine bonds that can be difficult to break down and also very persistent in the environment. So as part of EPA's efforts to address PFAS, EPA issued a PFAS action plan in February 2019. The action plan outlines EPA's commitments to take a wide variety of actions to address PFAS in both short-term and long-term timeframes. That's the agency's the first multimedia, multi-program, national research and risk communication plan ever issued by the EPA. The plan outlines the key action that EPA is taking to help provide the necessary tools to assist state, tribes, and the communities. Some of these actions include developing analytical methods for detecting PFAS in drinking waters and other environmental media, evaluating PFAS treatment techniques, understanding PFAS exposure from various media, evaluating statutory and regulatory mechanism to manage adverse human health and environmental impact from PFAS exposure. So among the, the, the important work that underway are uh, the efforts to address point source discharge of PFAS. We recognize the need for, a interim, for an interim strategy to address point source um, discharge of PFAS in EPA issued permit. So in February 2020, uh, a NIFTIS PFAS National Coordinators Committee was formed. This is also known as the PFAS work group, NIFTIS work group. It, uh, the, the work group comprised of EPA headquarters and representatives for all 10 EPA regions. I'm one of the uh, representatives um, with the, for the region or the EPA region too. The work group was charged with exploring options on how to address PFAS when other tools are being developed by the EPA. And the goal was to develop a strategy that would serve to guide the EPA's permitting approach on an interim basis across the EPA regions as informed by input from our state partners. To develop the potential recommendation for an interim st permitting strategy, the work group conducted thorough review of the indigenous permit process. The Clean Water Authorities, we analyzed existing state issue permits to understand the basis for PFAS conditions, monitoring requirements, monitoring frequency, detection, benchmarks in the current permits. 
And some of the bases, not surprisingly, include the protection of groundwater as a drinking water resource source, manufacturing PFAS on site, um, the use and storage of materials which may contain PFAS parameters, uh, potential or detectable PFAS in influent to the to the wastewater to the um, facilities, history of PFAS contamination in groundwater in the area, and also detectable PFAS concentration from recent sampling. The Rook Group also obtained input and perspective from our state partners. For instance, we had meeting with um, Association of the Clean Water Administrator, Aqua. We also talked with the state of Michigan, which has a, a guidance in place uh, for use within the state to address PFAS. We discussed the challenge of not having the approved analytical method and treatment techniques. However, at the end, um, the overall approach was developed to phase in monitoring requirement based on the potential presence of PFAS in the discharge and continue to share information while we continue to work on the to validate approved methods and also treatment techniques. So a couple months ago in November uh, 2020, EPA issued a memorandum detailing an interim NIPTES permitting strategy for addressing PFAS in EPA issued wastewater permits. The strategy includes three recommendations to guide the decision making at the permit rider level for monitoring requirements and also stormwater controls. The strategy is intended for EPA issue permit, but it also commits the EPA to help and build resource for knowledge sharing among the permit writers nationwide. So the recommendation number one, um, the, the work group recommends that EPA NIPTES permit writers, MPDES permit writers, consider incorporating permit requirements for monitoring PFAS at facilities where PFAS are expected to be present in point source wastewater discharge. The PFAS that could consider for monitoring are those that will have an analytical method for wastewater testing. So this recommendation is actually consistent with EPA's 2010 NIPTES permit writer's manual. Um, where it talks about pollutants otherwise expected to be present in the discharge. So the menu notes that there may be pollutants that don't have monitoring data, but because of the raw material stored or used at the facility, products or byproducts of the facility operation or data available from a similar facility. The permit writer has the basis for expecting that a pollutant could be present in the discharge. So that's the basis for requiring a monitoring requirement when there when there's expect when pollutants are expected to be present in the discharge. We also recognize that the need for a reliable and accurate analytical method for incorporating monitoring requirements in a permit. So the work group recommends a phase approach such that monitoring requirements are triggered at a time when EPA's methods are approved and available to the public. EPA does expect to have a validated analytical method available for detecting certain PFAS in wastewater and some other metrics in 2021 and later, this, later on this year. In general, the permit authority requires the use of methods approved at 40 CFR Part 136 for compliance with the, per, with the monitoring requirement. However, if no, per, no approved permits are available at 40 CFR Part 136, the permitting authority has the discretion to specify the use of a suitable permits, per, uh, methods. Recommendation number one also include um, um, a consideration and incorporate incorporation of best management practice when appropriate, where um, authorized for both, where um, it's appropriate for both direct and direct and direct discharge. So that's include industrial facility and also PODWs. Recommendation number two. This one is very similar to the recommendation number one, except this is more geared for stormwater and pollution control for um, stormwater runoff. The work group recommendation recommends that um, the consideration of pollution pollution control measures in municipal separate storm sewer system (MS4) and industrial stormwater permits when PFAS are expected to be present in the stormwater discharge. And similar to, to a recommendation number one, um, the work group recommend a phased approach to incorporate monitoring 
such that when such that it would be triggered by there is an approved uh, EPA method available for monitoring or testing. The work could also cons recommend consideration of um, using additional or, or general types of control to reduce PFAS discharge in stormwater. Some of these approach and, and types of um, uh, controls are, for, it, for instance, or MS4, uh, the public education and outreach, illicit discharge detection and elimination, uh, storm, construction stormwater went off, and pollutant prevention measures. Industrial stormwater, uh, the pollution, uh, the the outreach, uh, the uh, pollution control would be stormwater pollution prevention plan, and also conducting monitoring and inspections. Recommendation number three is about information sharing. The work group recommends that um, the for uh, to build on the work that has already started on PFAS the specific communications, knowledge sharing, capacity building, and training at federal and state levels. One such example would be um, the publishing of a permitting compendia. Compendium is a collection of examples of different permitting approaches that EPA identifies nationwide, reviewing all the MPDS permits and including a specific program area. It's a source of information for state and EPA to learn about the practice uh, being adopted in the MPDS permit to address PFAS across nation. And the current compendium is available at the website shown here. Another piece of information sharing is to establish a mechanism for information sharing to facilitate frequent and timely communication with the state and our partner as, as the uh, information available become available for um, the permit authorities. We also encourage the using EPA's NIPTES permit writers clearinghouse. Um, within the EPA office, we, we have this set up and um, it's a popular site to go to for permit writers. Clearinghouse is a searchable big database containing resources such as permit templates and webinars that are shared by the NIPTES authorities. The last piece of um, information sharing is the, is the continuation of the work group. Um, the work group already started a forum for discharge for discussion on PFAS in the context of the MPDES permitting. We saw the invaluable insight from key stakeholders at the EPA regions and the state levels, and that um, it was experienced by um, the cause of getting this interim strategy um, finalized. The work group also served as an ongoing source of NIPTES permit knowledge and practicing through continued collaboration with the state and permit authorities. And we hope to work with all the states uh, nationwide to continue improving on addressing PFAS. Lastly, this is a timetable that um, the work group have put together um, an action items for uh, communication sharing and including build out uh, relevant NIPTES uh, permitting information on EPA's PFAS website, um, NIPTES Permit Writer Clearinghouse, uh, that's going to come out in, in June of this year. We also plan to publish a um, compendium that provides examples of the permit condition being developed and issued by EPA, and it will come out the third quarter of 2021. We're going to continue to host all quarter quarterly meeting with the regional coordinators already starting, broadcasting two webinars for state and EPA regions on relevant PFAS topics, first quarter of 2021, and lastly, work with the Association of Clean Water Administrator Aqua to organize a second state listening session. It's being planned for the first quarter of 2021. With that, I will point it to the EPA website where you can find lots of uh, information available, including um, action plan, including the progress of where we are with um, items being addressed um, to used to address PFAS. And that's conclude my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Long. Okay. Um, we might have a few minutes for questions. If there's some specific questions for Ms. Wong, um, if you could put them in the chat. Jen, had we seen any uh, specific questions for her? Hey, Tony, this is John. I, I do not see anything specific. 
Okay. There's a, an email address there that Ms. Wong had offered. So if someone has a follow-up question is what they had a chance to digest some of the material that she offered us, you know, please to do so. Um, and thank you very much again, Ms. Wong, for your, for your input and your insight and all that. We really appreciate your attendance today. Thank we'll you. be meeting with you soon, I'm sure, on um, further issues in this regard. Sorry about the glitch. I, I didn't show the camera previously. I just don't want to have anything to interfere with what I need to present. And appreciate <laughs> the opportunity again. Thank you. That was very good. Thank you very much. All right, next. Um, we have two presenters from the state of Colorado. We have... Meg Parrish, who is the permit section manager for the Colorado Water Quality Control Division's Clean Water Program. In this capacity, she and her team implement Water Quality Act and Water and Colorado Water Quality Control Act permitting programs. Meg has a JD from Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C., and has previously worked as an environmental attorney at the Colorado Attorney General's Office, Earth Justice, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Hogan Lovells LLP. She has 15 years of experience in environmental law and regulation. Our second speaker also, and I don't know whether you guys are working in tandem or whether you're going to uh, work individually. Uh, Meg, uh, is your presentation separate from that of Josie's or are you working together? We're working together. I, I'll present and then um, I'll, I'll hand it off to Josie for, to, to talk about some slides. All right, cool. And then I'll introduce her accordingly at the end of your presentation. Thank you. And thank oh, you for being here today. Okay, excellent. I will th thank you all so much. Um, we are uh, really um, honored to be asked to be talking with you today. I, I hope that kind of Colorado's experience in some of these things is useful. Um, just, you know, I would note a lot of a lot of states are doing really great things. So um, I'm really excited about um, EPA's work here and kind of the us sort of the push to having states collaborate and share what we're doing. I think um, we're excited to learn from you all. Um, and we're just thank you all for the opportunity to talk today. Um, and and I also, if, if there's time for questions, um, I'm happy to take them. So if folks want to put them in the chat while I'm talking, um, I'm, I'm happy to address them at the end. Um, all right, let me figure out the sharing piece. Um, and this is a this is actually a Google um, presentation, so I can I'll, I'll, I'll share the link and put it in the chat afterwards if folks want to see it. Um, so I am um, I'm I'm joined by Josie News, who is our um, water quality scientist, and um, she's going to be talking. I'm going to be talking kind of big picture. Josie's going to be really talking about the the basis for some of the numbers that we're working on, what, that we work with it here in Colorado. Um, so just real basic, we're going to be talking about why we took on PFAS, when did we start, um, and sort of a, a, an unusual approach that we have taken um, called Policy 20-1. Um, so we were asked specifically kind of why we started, and I think like um, many states, um, the reason that Colorado started working on PFAS issues is because something terrible happened. Um, 2013 and 2014, um, large um, quantities of PFAS were detected in a, a number of wells in the area sort of south of Colorado Springs, um, a security-wide field and fountain. Um, this was uh, linked to, if you see on the map there, um, on the right-hand corner, you'll see an, uh, um, Peterson Air Force Base um, and their their use of um, triple, what we call a triple F foam, um, which has high levels of PFAS. Um, soaked into the aquifer, contaminated water supplies for um, approximately 65,000 folks. Um, and the folks in that area, so our state has worked really aggressively, as it sounds like um, New Jersey has, to get the federal government to clean up its, um, its bases. Um, the Peterson has um, installed water treatment plants um, in this area to, to treat for PFAS so that folks now have clean drinking water, but um, there were some very significant health impacts. Um, in, uh, CDC did a study, I, I wanna say um, two years ago, 
of PFAS blood levels in this area, and they were um, two to 12 times higher than national averages. So water is clean now, but the, the health impacts um, uh, continue. Um, we also had, uh, thankfully, we were able to catch it very early, but um, high PFAS levels um, in the groundwater um, municipal well in for the South Adams County um, Municipal Water System, which is sort of the area north of Denver um, and serves a large number of people. Um, there we were able to, our drinking water program was able to um, work with the drinking water system, have them blend the water before it was served to folks. But again, um, we are, Colorado is, is working on this issue because it is a, a pretty urgent issue to the to public health of many of our, our residents. Um, just as we sort of start um, kind of things that, you know, the thinking about the approach that we're taking and how it's a little different. Um, one piece is that we, um, we are one of the most under-resourced water quality um, control divisions in the, the, the country, I believe. So we did not have the resources to develop our own standards or to develop, unfortunately, our own MCLs. And um, it's just, we are uh, super impressed that New Jersey has done that. That's a, those are, that's a difficult and impressive achievement. Um, we also have a, a history, of, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, of using the narrative water quality standard um, to set um, numeric effluent limits. Um, and so and it's for things like total dissolved solids, for salts, and um, for, for other pollutants. So uh, this is sort of, so this is kind of the big piece of how we have looked at protecting surface water from PFAS um, is this Water Quality Control Commission Policy 20-1. Um, the policy kind of high level sets what we call translation levels for five PFAS, and we'll go into what they are. Um, it's intended as an interim step before we get to adoption of water quality standards. Um, it provides some specific direction as to permitting, it, it, it has a list of kind of what PFAS um, we should be monitoring for. Um, so the question we get all the time, particularly because it sets these translation levels is, is this a water quality standard? And the answer is no. What we decided to do instead of setting our own water quality standards for PFOA, PFAS, PFNA is to use our existing narrative standard, which um, I put it here because I'm guessing New Jersey's is probably almost exactly the same. I think ours is, is the federal language um, that, that uh, you know, our surface water should be free from substances um, attributable to human caused point sources, um, skipping through in amounts which are harmful or toxic to humans. Um, and that's that's our sort of um, that applies to all waters throughout the throughout the state. And what we did with this policy is we said, okay, what does that mean for PFAS? What amount of PFAS is going to be harmful to beneficial uses or toxic to humans? And that's what the policy kind of seeks to uh, to to sort of tell us. So it's interpreting this existing um, narrative uh, water quality standard. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Josie now um, and to sort of talk about what the what the translation levels the policy has and kind of how we develop those. Great, thank you, Meg. Um, I'm Josie Nuz. I'm with the Qual Water Quality Control Division at Colorado. Um, I'm with the Standards Unit. Um, and so, yeah, I'll dive in a little bit to um, how we set these translation levels. And as Meg said, I'm happy to answer questions as well. Um, so this slide shows the translation levels that we included in the policy. Um, as Sean mentioned, there aren't uh, federal water quality criteria to rely on here, um, but there are um, some federal assessments that were available at the time. 
Um, and so we relied on those. And those were those that were performed um, using comprehensive systematic um, reviews of the toxicity data. So specifically, um, we relied on the EPA health advisory for PFO and PFOS, um, the draft ATSDR toxicological profile for PFNA, um, and then for PF uh, or and PFHXS, and then for um, PFBS, we relied on the PPRTV regional screening level for groundwater. Um, the the translation levels um, also account for parent compounds, which I'll I'll kind of discuss a little bit later. Um, and then the groupings here um, that are shown are based on the critical um, endpoint that was observed for each of these compounds. Um, so PFA, PFOS, and PFNA are grouped because um, developmental toxicity was kind of the critical effect, whereas PFHXS and PFBS um, were kept separate because they exhibited sort of different um, critical effects. And this, this approach aligns with how EPA handled things in the health advisory where they grouped PFO and PFOS based on um, critical developmental effects. And Meg, I don't think it's, oh, there we go. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, great. Um, so as I mentioned, we did use the ATSDR um, assessment, but since it was in draft form still, um, we didn't rely directly on the minimum risk levels for PFNA and PFHXS to derive the translation levels, but rather we looked at the relative toxicity observed for um, those two compared to the PFO and PFOS. Um, and we used the comparative toxicity to then inform the translation levels. So as kind of is depicted here, um, the, the, the um, translation level for PFNA was set equal to the, um, the translation level from PFO and PFOS, which came from the EPA health advisory. Um, and whereas the translation level for PFHXS was set at 10 times that. Next slide, please, Meg. Um, we also wanted to sort of capture um, parent, the concept of parent compounds. Um, and so, the idea here is that um, in the literature, some, some of the larger PFAS um, had been shown to be able to degrade to the smaller PFAS uh, in the environment. And those are, those are depicted in the, in the green boxes here. And just to kind of step through this conceptually, um, if you look at the picture on the bottom, um, there are sort of key functional groups in, and this is a rough depiction, but just to give you an idea, um, there are sort of key functional groups um, that represent the smaller PFAS with the known toxicity. Um, and these smaller PFAS can either be directly released into the environment or also be the result of um, releases of the, of the larger PFAS, um, which can then break apart in the environment and form the smaller PFAS that then uh, stick around and don't incur further degradation. Uh, next slide, please, Meg. So um, the policy also, just switching gears a little bit, also um, provided some guidance uh, uh, as far as laboratory methods for monitoring. Um, this was admittedly a challenge um, because as several folks have mentioned, there isn't a currently approved EPA method. So we did our best um, in coordination with EPA to sort of uh, try and understand where they thought they were headed and to align with that. Um, so these the recommendations are specific to analytical methods for wastewater. Um, they include 25 PFAS that is um, at the time was the best understanding of where of which PFAS would be included in the eventual EPA approved method. Um, and we did recommend that we didn't have a specific method that we um, are holding folks to. We did recommend that whatever method was selected, selected was in, aligned with the DOD quality assurance protocols. Um, and this approach, we tried to balance um, 
base to give folks flexibility so that they could find a lab that was able to um, perform these measurements, but also to, to hone in on comparable and replicable results. And I'll hand it back to you now, Meg. Excellent. Can you can you all still see the slides? Um, my apologies. I might have to reshare them. Yeah, we see them. Oh, there let me. My okay, excellent. Um, so the policy also, and I think this might be something that I know we've gotten some specific questions on from folks in other states. The policy does try and because it's sort of an interim step before we adopt water quality standards specifically for PFAS, um, it it does try and kind of have a little bit of a middle ground in terms of permitting. So it gives these sort of specific directions to the division so that we're kind of, we are approaching PFAS and putting PFAS limits in permits in a different way than we are, than we do for other pollutants, right? For a normal pollutant, you got a water quality standard of 10, you do your math, you, you know, you figure out how much dilution, and then you put the you put the effluent limit in your permit. That's not quite how it's going to go for, for PFAS. Specifically, the policy explicitly says we're not to do effluent limits for stormwater. Um, and that POTWs get a full term of monitoring before we would put any effluent limit in their in their permit. And the reason is because our Water Quality Control Commission was really focused on getting POTWs to do um, source control and, you know, doing source investigation and source control. Um, that has been a really successful approach in some other states, particularly Michigan, um, as a way to get um, waste, big wastewater treatment plants PFAS levels down considerably. They go up the stream, they look at who's contributing um, you know, waste to their wastewater treatment plant. They say, hey, you're using a fume suppressant with PFAS in it. What if you substitute this other fume suppressant at your you know, um, chrome plating facility that doesn't use PFAS? Um, folks do that, and then you'll see a, a really dramatic uh, decrease in PFAS levels at that domestic wastewater treatment plant. Um, so that so that's been um, with that sort of knowledge of kind of what happened in Michigan, our commission is wants us to do something similar where we're working with domestic wastewater treatment plants, municipal wastewater treatment plants and getting them to kind of look upstream, look at the industries and try and get that PFAS out of the treatment plant before we need to figure out treatment and meeting effluent limits. Um, another important thing was that it explicitly allowed um, us to uh, not set effluent limits when um, for discharges that were uh, where the there was some where it wasn't completely clear as to how long they would be or where what kind of impact they would have. And as I'm going to talk about in a minute, that allowed us to kind of ex make an exception for construction dewatering, um, which was the folks. Um, People, the people that were most opposed to the passage of this policy were the folks that were really concerned about how it would impact construction dewatering and how it would impact domestic wastewater treatment plants. So um, that's one of the reasons that this was sort of built into the policy so that we would have the flexibility to address those concerns and give them, give those dischargers more flexibility. Um, in terms of implementation, so this policy got passed in July. We are still figuring it out. Um, <laughs> uh, one big piece that we did is we did a survey of all of our dischargers. So all the folks that have permits, except for construction, stormwater, and for dewatering. We didn't do dewatering because those folks have to submit a, a source water sample before we give them a permit anyways. And construction stormwater just doesn't seem to be a place where you see a lot of people. I put the question because this was something that came up earlier. This was sort of one of the big questions that we asked um, uh, municipal uh, wastewater treatment plants was if they received waste from the, like the, these categories, because this is sort of what we saw as kind of the um, the big red flags. 
Um, so your landfills, your centralized waste treaters, um, chrome plating facilities, um, and, and airports. Uh, those, are, have, those have been kind of some of the ones where we've seen really big pieces. We also asked them to submit if they had already done monitoring, and that has been super interesting um, looking at that. Um, some, some folks have, and also a number of wastewater treatment plants um, reported some pretty significant pass-through events where you know um, it wasn't quite as bad as I don't know if you all have seen, but there's a there's this sort of terrible picture from Virginia of kind of foam floating, a triple F foam floating down a river. It wasn't quite that bad, but we did have wastewater treatment plants report to us some pretty significant um, incidents where a, a big sort of slug of foam came into their their facility. Um, we're moving forward with monitoring. Um, we're monitoring all of our, our long-term remediation dewatering permits have monitoring, um, actually not all of them, but many of them. Um, we're re about to do some division initiated modifications on our large wastewater treatment plants in the state so that they will be um, monitoring for PFAS. Um, and we are, um, we're in the middle of renewing our industrial stormwater permit right now. And we're gonna be requiring at least in the draft, um, PFAS monitoring and some specific um, industrial stormwater sectors. Um, and I've got them listed here. Um, in terms of effluent limits, um, we have issued um, permit certifications now with effluent limits for those for PFAS, specifically those five translation levels that Josie walked you through. Um, and we are um, going to be proposing um, effluent limits this year for a, uh, a discharge permit for an oil refinery and potentially for a discharge permit for a landfill. Uh, lessons learned, just kind of big picture pieces. Some of these are probably fairly obvious, but um, as, as Josie noted, the laboratory capacity issue for, for sampling wastewater for PFAS is, is still fairly difficult. You know, getting our policy kind of has a sort of minimum levels that we would like to see um, and getting labs to be able to do those has been difficult. Um, uh, we've been really surprised. So through our dewatering program, folks have been submitting source water samples. Um, so kind of exactly like what, you know, you want to, you're building a parking garage in downtown Denver you need a dewatering permit. So they give us a source water sample and it includes PFAS. And a lot of those have been much higher than we would have expected, even in sort of areas where we don't know about past AFFF foam use or they're not particularly urban or um, not particularly industrial. We've got a couple um, really high levels from a university that we, um, so that has, that has been a surprise. And I don't know if that's something that folks in other areas of the country are seeing. Um, I think one really big piece here is that pretreatment programs and supporting pretreatment programs um, is a really critical piece. Um, we don't have delegation for pretreatment, EPA does, and they've been a fantastic partner with us. Um, but I, I think just uh, pretreatment for domestic wastewater treatment plants is, is a, such a powerful tool um, for controlling PFAS. And it's, it's I think it just, as much resources and as focus you can give it what is great. Um, and then just, you know, because this is new, there's been a lot of like little things that we've had to figure out. And I gotta say, I'm super excited about that we might be finally getting a 40 CFR 136 method because that will make a lot of this work a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so um, questions or... Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Meg and Josie for... Uh, with that information, it's a lot of uh, a lot of good info. And Sorry, really we threw a lot at you. We got excited. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, thank you. That's why we asked you to come here. You have a lot of good information to offer. Well, I, I saw that we did have some questions in there. We don't have a lot of time, but uh, Jen and John, if you could um, check out some of those questions, would you folks be able to answer a few? Um, you know, but again, we have to be time uh, limited on time that we have. Yeah, Tony, this is John. Uh, so we do have three questions. Uh, I believe the first one, it was, addr was addressed to uh, EPA at the conclusion of her remarks, of uh, Ms. Wong's remarks. That was from Jim Cosgrove, uh, referencing the analytical methods were mentioned for monitoring wastewater. How do we monitor without those methods? 
So the uh, this Virginia, um, the the recommendation uh, in the interim strategy is we would consider putting the monitoring in. However, it would be at a time monitoring would would start at a time when EPA has an approved method, and we anticipate um, some of these some of these method will be available sometime this year. So hopefully we don't have to wait a long time before we can actually um, put some of this requirement in the permit um, conditions. Thank you. Uh, the next two questions I think are uh, directed towards our colleagues at Colorado. The first one is from Ryan Krauss to find what a full term of monitoring means and how long is a full term? Oh, I, yes, and I'm so sorry. I should have I, I, I went into permitting lingo and I should have used normal language instead. So a, a permit term is usually five years. Unfortunately, due to our limited resources here in Colorado, we do have a permit backlog. So probably it's more likely that um, you won't get a new permit until like five or six till about six years. So basically they've got under under kind of our policy. Um, municipal wastewater treatment plants get basically six years, at least six years of monitoring before they're going to get effluent limits. And now note this this is an interim strategy. It could it could change. Uh, particularly if, if EPA develops um, water quality standards or criteria. Thank you. Uh, so we have Tony, we have one more question, which I'll, I'll about to ask. And I think again, it's directed to uh, Meg and we have Amy Goldsmith also raising her hand. So if it's OK with you, Tony, I'll, I'll pose the question. And then once the answer is given, we could go to Amy if she would like to ask a question live. Thank you. Uh, so this question is from Joshua Ballantin. Uh, to date, have any Colorado NIPTES uh, permits for municipal wastewater treatment plants been issued with PFAS effluent standards? Uh, no. So and they um, so we're going to be just doing monitoring for at least the next six years for for um, municipal wastewater treatment plants. We are putting effluent limits in industrial plants. Um, and other other dischargers like dewatering. Thank you. And uh, so now the only one remaining, Amy, uh, if you'd like to turn your microphone on. Yes, thank you. Um, my question, um, thank you for being here. And I think you know one of my counterparts at Clean Water Action, Jennifer Peters. So yes. I just want to do a shout out to you on your great work. Um, I want to know how you move from discretion over allowing um, short-term dischargers to realizing a pattern of cumulative discharging and then you know larger impact well so what we did is sort of we have general permits for these short-term um discharges so for your construction dewatering and so basically like less than two years right um and so we built that into the um those permits that um that that folks uh what we said is that um you needed to submit a sample for PFAS um, if you're in sort of areas of known contamination, kind of urban areas. And um, if, your, if your sample is an order of magnitude over that translation level, so essentially 700 PPT, we will kind of kick you into a stricter permit and give you a limit. Mm -hmm. So there are some short-term discharges that we are going to be permitting, but they have to essentially be really extreme at this point. Um, as part of that general permit, we are getting better flow data. So we're hoping when we renew it next time, we'll have much more information. So kind of your, your piece about cumulative discharges and you know what that looks like. We don't know that yet because we don't have good flow data, but in the, in the future, I think we will kind of know a little bit more about all these drips and drabs of dewatering, kind of how it is impacting um, water quality. Thank you. Tony, we do have one more question in the chat. If uh, if it's okay, we could hit that and then move on to the next segment for public testimony. All right, I guess that's Gary Brun. Yeah, Gary. Uh, Gary's question is long term. What type of performance metrics is Colorado or EPA considering to judge the success of a PFAS regulatory program? I can take a shot if that um, if that works. So we um, we have started doing some um, surface water sampling for PFAS and um, not as much as we would like. Um, we are hoping to do more 
Um, but it has shown that there are sort of higher levels in particular areas. So kind of in one area of sort of urban Denver, we've seen in that surface water um, a 70 parts per trillion for PFOA plus PFOS, which is at exactly sort of at our translation level at the EPA Health Advisory. Um, so, you know, we are, we are, we, we would like to get that number down um, if, you know, it discharges into a water supply. Um, we're also doing a lot of, we've done some sampling of drinking water intakes. We're going to be continuing to do those. Um, you know, the protection of drinking water is really the, the key piece here and protection of public drinking water, protection of private wells, alluvial wells, you know, all, all of those pieces of, of, of protecting drinking water is, is really our, our fundamental goal. And how, and I think Thank at this point, much. how we would judge success. Thank you very much. All right, Meg. Josie and Virginia, thank you for your presentations. Um, it's always great to hear what goes on in other places besides Jersey. You know, we get sorry get wrapped up in New Jersey and what we do, but it's good to hear what other folks are doing because it it then leads us into uh, better actions ourselves. So thank you very much. Um, you know, if if I I believe the presenters offered their email address if there was any specific questions afterwards. Uh, so that's much appreciated, and thank you again for your time. We're at this point, we're going to move into, um, you know, public comment, which is the essence of, of this um, of this meeting. And I know we have a lot of uh, folks that have indicated that they would like to make comment. And thank you. That's why we're here. That's what we're all about. And I appreciate it. But remember, there's a lot of folks that want to give comment today, and we don't have an awful lot of time to do that. Uh, we will take comments for about three four minutes? No? I understand there's going to be a method where uh, you'll get a yellow light when you have 30 seconds left and a red light that'll indicate that your time is basically up. Not to think that your comments are going to be uh, not allowed, because they will be, and you'll have until January the 29th to submit them in writing. We prefer that you submit them in writing, and I believe that we were hoping that we would get them in Word format so that they would be able to be incorporated, you know, better for us. Again, this presentation was being taped. It's going to be an included on the council's website. It could be responded to, it could be looked at, it could be commented on, and we want to get your comments by January 29th so we can wrap it up. So with, without any further ado, please, um, please limit your, 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 you know, your position for about three minutes, if you would, please, three to four minutes. And John and uh, Jen, if I could ask you to list those folks in order of their appearance in the chat. Okay, Tony, uh, I will drop uh, the, the numbered order. Uh, we have a total of 13 as of right now, uh, folks who have uh, requested to testify. The first, I'll provide the first two. Uh, and again, as a reminder, please keep your uh, microphones muted and your cameras off. The cameras off will just help to maintain uh, the uh, presentation that's up that provides the target questions and certainly the microphone on mute until you're called to testify. So the first person uh, on the list is Pam Carolyn from Mount Laurel MUA and to follow her will be Tom. And I apologize for the, the butchery here. Lost. Lawson from Passaic Valley Sewage Commission. Hi, this is Pam. I turned my camera on. Is that what you do? You want the cameras on or off? For presenting, you, you keep your camera on. OK, um, my name is Pam Carolyn. I'm the executive director of the Mount Laurel MUA. We're a drinking water and a wastewater utility. Um, I'm also a member of the Association of Environmental Authorities of New Jersey, AEA, where I serve as the chair of the Nijipis Committee. Our members share your concerns. The wastewater sector is concerned about the presence of, P of PFAS compounds in the environment and is encouraged by the growing body of information that will help make prudent, practical management decisions. We're partners in environmental protection. AEA members have worked successfully with the DEP to address nitrate in the Passaic River and PCBs in the Delaware. There are key factors relating to PFAS and wastewater that need to be considered. Wastewater treatment plants were not designed for removing PFAS chemicals because they were largely built before there was awareness about the ubiquitous nature of PFAS chemicals. 
and their potential for harming human health. Because of this and the fact that there are several thousand PFAS compounds, um, PFAS chemicals, determining the technologies can be used as complex. There are limited alternatives for the residuals or biosolids that publicly owned treatment facilities produce. It is important to consider the environmental and financial impacts as they pertain to this. According to the, to the National Association of Clean Water Agencies and other industry groups, the three most viable treatment technologies are thermal treatment, RO, and ion exchange. These applications are all very expensive and the effectiveness varies with the type of PFAS chemical being treated. This is why it's so important to get this right. We need to take a proactive approach. As stewards of the environment and public health, wastewater utilities are already taking necessary steps to protect public health. Source control is the solution. It is imperative to disclose and phase out production and use, both domestic and foreign, at manufacturing facilities and find safer alternatives for heavy use areas such as firefighting training sites. So long as PFAS are contained in products used in our everyday lives and background levels resulting for decades of manufacturing and use persist, these chemicals will continue to be found in receiver streams. Controlling and reducing the prevalence of those PFAS that are of known significant concern must also be addressed by preventing their use in commerce and or release to the environment. Those who manufacture these chemicals should be responsible for any needed remediation and the elimination of PFAS from uses that pose a threat to the environment. Source control works, PFOS and PFOA, the two most common chemicals were phased out of production in the US in 2002 and 2015 respectively, although they're still present in some imported products. PFOA and PFAS are found in the blood of Americans in concentrations or the concentrations of the blood of in Americans have decreased by 70% for PFOA and 84% for PFAS between 1999 and 2014. This coincides with the end of the production and phase out of PFOA and PFAS in the US. AEA recommends, one, monitoring of drinking water under the new regulations is just beginning in New Jersey. Allow time for gathering and analysis of the valuable data that the drinking water regulations will provide to help determine points of greatest concern. Two, there is no EPA approved analytical testing method for PFAS or the suite of PFAS precursors in environmental media other than in drinking water. This is why AEA objected to imposing effluent limits on groundwater dischargers. We believe the DEP was wrong in assuming that testing wastewater could be done accurately and effectively. 30 EPA seconds. EPA's designation of method analysis is expected within a relatively short time, so waiting for it will create clarity and uniformity. Three, study the approaches being used by other EPA regions such as one, three, four, and five, and let them guide New Jersey's approach. And four, consider having POTW samples sample as a part of a study like in Colorado. The results can help identify hotspots so that appropriate source control measures can be implemented. My colleagues will expand further on these points and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. John, you want to go to the next person? Sure, next up is Tom Lauston from the State Valley Sewage Commission, and then Ronald Anastasio from uh, Somerset uh, Raritan Valley Sewage will follow. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Lawson, the Chief Operating Officer of the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission. I want to commend the Council for convening this hearing on a topic of great importance to the state. PBSC shares DEP's concerns about the presence of PFAS compounds in the environment. Control and elimination of these forever com chemicals is incredibly complex, but we're encouraged by the growing body of information that will help us make prudent and practical management decisions while appropriately protecting public health. PBSC owns and operates the Newark Bay Treatment Plant, one of the largest wastewater treatment plants in the United States. It is important to note that PBSC does not manufacture, produce, or in any way profit from PFAS chemicals. PFAS can be introduced into the sewer system from a variety of waste streams, domestic, industrial, and commercial. In addition, PBSC has a large liquid waste acceptance program where we take wastewater, 
leachate and sludges from various sources, which may also contribute PFAS. PVSC's treatment plant was designed prior to the ability to detect PFAS chemicals, and the plant does not currently have equipment and technology installed that can remove and treat these emerging contaminants. Once the chemicals reach the sewer system, the battle to eliminate them from the environment is lost. They will persist in residuals and biosolids regardless of treatment. <clears throat> Identifying and minimizing the use of PFAS-containing products will go a long way towards reducing loadings to our facilities and state's waters. I want to let you know that PVSC is not waiting for regulations, and we are taking a proactive approach. We have developed and are implementing a source identification and minimization program to reduce the amount of PFAS discharge into the municipal wastewater system, whether directly or through partnering loca locality sewer systems. As a co-regulator, implementing and enforcing an industrial pretreatment program we are uniquely positioned to drive source identification and minimization. We have begun and will continue sampling our influent and effluent for PFAS. These efforts will allow PFAS to establish a baseline of PFAS levels to assist in identifying any trends and contributions from domestic and non-domestic users. I would also like to point out that PVSC participated in the WORF study where we provided samples of our sludge cake for analysis. We're still waiting for those results. In addition, we'll also be collecting representative samples of our hauled in liquid waste, which can be comprised of landfill leachate, septage, groundwater, sludges, and sanitary waste. We're also planning on going out into our sewer district to collect additional samples to try and identify areas of elevated levels. We recently sent letters to all of our nearly 200 significant industrial users requiring disclosure of PFAS use and their presence at their facilities. If responses or monitoring data identify significant contributions of PFAS from an industrial user, PVSC will staff will meet the user and evaluate PFAS loadings from the facility. The industry will be asked to incorporate best management practices to minimize PFAS discharges. PVSC will update and implement its industrial pretreatment program permits and policies as necessary to support and mandate this, the minimization approach. In closing, promulgating surface water standards that would require costly treatment plant upgrades is premature and would unfairly burden ratepayers, many who are residents of environmental justice communities rather than affixing the costs to those who profit from the use of these chemicals. Source control is critical to solving the PFAS problem, and PVSE is committed to identifying and minimizing PFAS loadings to our treatment plant and the environment. However, we need time to implement our program to determine the effectiveness, and we'll look, work closely with the New Jersey DEP as we do so. I would thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Ron, how you doing, Ronnie? Anastasio from the Somerset Raritan Valley Storage Authority. Yes, good afternoon. Hello, Tony, and uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks to NJDEP and the uh, Clean Water Council for uh, holding this very important hearing. I uh, want to point out that uh, members of the AEA are here to express concerns about rushing to place in the GYPTES permit limits on, limits on wastewater treatment plants. But we also must be aware of the unintended, unintended consequences of doing this on sludge, man, sludge management and disposal. SRVSA is one of five regional wastewater authorities within the state that dispose of its sludge through on-site incineration. Of these five incinerator authorities in the state, three of these uh, authorities have fluidized bed incinerators that recently added carbon scrubbers to comply with stricter EPA and DEP air limits. Uh, currently, about 20% of the biosolids, uh, the biosolid sludge generated in New Jersey is disposed of through incineration at these five facilities. But according to the latest EPA guidance document and a recent WEF research paper, there is limited information available on the fate of these uh, PFAS compounds through incineration. Although the main focus of today's testimony is on the setting of discharge limits, both the regulatory agencies and the regulated community need a better understanding of these issues as it relates to uh, the fate of these compounds through incineration and the greater impact on sludge uh, disposal at large. Uh, the destruction of Superstorm Sandy caused a number of coastal wastewater treatment facilities to be severely disrupted, affecting sludge disposal. Alternate sludge disposal locations had to be found and the state as a whole was barely able to meet its sludge disposal needs. Setting discharge limits before we fully understand the impl implications could cause disruptions to sludge disposal means and methods. 
What makes more sense is for the wastewater treatment plants to begin performing their periodic, let's say, uh, let's say quarterly influent and effluent sampling for these compounds for screening purposes only in the same way that we perform our semi-annual and annual WCR sampling in our NGIPTES permits. From this data, we would and could and would perform track down studies to see if we can identify specific point sources and work towards reducing or eliminating them. We do this while the water treatment plants are performing their sampling to determine if they meet or exceed uh, the, new, the newly imposed limits on drinking water, and if necessary, construct additional treatment processes to remove these compounds from the drinking water. We, the dischargers, will continue to perform this periodic sampling to look for possible reductions of PFAS compounds coming into wastewater treatment plants. A TMDL study could then be performed to determine appropriate discharge limits for specific plants. And remember, much of the raw sewage flowing into our plants is former drinking water that was used domestically for its intended purposes. If water treatment plants are actively removing PFAS compounds, then the wastewater treatment plant should also see some benefit from the removal at the water treatment plants. We want to partner with the NJDEP to work towards solving this problem, but we also want to do it in a way that is based on science and practicality targeted to where the problems exist. And I do want to point out that uh, we had some heard some very encouraging uh, words from our friends in Colorado, and it makes sense to uh, have a rather long monitoring period so that we fully understand this process, at least for the wastewater treatment plants, while the water treatment plants are in implementing their 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 changes. So I want to thank NJDEP and the Clean Water Council for holding this uh, hearing. And uh, we look forward to working with you and partnering in the future to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, John Sherry, did I pronounce that right, from Mont McDonald? Yes, thank you. So good afternoon. My name is John Sherry, and I'm a licensed professional engineer in New Jersey. I have over 30 years of experience in the industry and have worked on over 50 wastewater treatment facilities. I'm a member of the AEA board and as senior vice president at Mont McDonald and currently serve in the role of Mont McDonald's North American Wastewater Practice Leader. Mont McDonald has been involved in the design of PFAS removal systems for drinking water since 2007. I appreciate this opportunity afforded by the Clean Water Council and New Jersey DEP to provide testimony on PFAS removal technologies that are potentially applicable for large scale wastewater treatment facilities. Domestic wastewater facilities are receivers of sewage that may contain PFAS. Most wastewater treatment facilities rely upon conventional treatment processes, which in general include preliminary treatment, primary sedimentation, biological activated sludge, coagulation processes, flocculation, secondary sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. These conventional treatment processes show little, if any, effectiveness for removal of PFAS to the part per trillion range. It is relevant to note that biosolids produced by conventional treatment will also contain PFAS. In October 2020, a recent study uh, conducted by CDM Smith in collaboration with NACWA, WEF, and the New England Biosolids Reuse Association indicated that the impact of PFAS on biosolids management has significantly increased disposal costs. The study found that disposal practices where regulation has occur occurred in the U.S. has diverted beneficial reuse to landfill disposal. I am not aware of any large-scale wastewater facilities in the U.S. or globally that have been modified solely to address PFAS. However, drinking water treatment facilities have implemented processes that are known to be effective. In practice, these generally have included activated carbon, anion exchange, and reverse osmosis. In New Jersey, there are approximately 10 water treatment facilities that are designed to remove PFAS. There are also a number of drinking water facilities that are in planning, design, and construction. These facilities rely upon activated carbon or anion exchange. The implementation of PFAS removal at drinking water facilities is similar throughout the US. We are aware of one drinking water facility that is planning to install a reverse osmosis to address PFAS. 
where reverse osmosis has been selected, there are usually other factors in addition to PFAS that have driven the, the decision to select that technology. The processes implemented at drinking water facilities are potentially available to wastewater facilities, but will be very difficult to implement at large scale wastewater treatment plants. The challenges in applying the three primary removal processes at wastewater facilities is due to a number of factors. First, wastewater contains compounds such as total organic car carbon and other constituents that will preferentially consume available sorption sites on activated carbon or ion exchange media. Pretreatment and a, ver and a very large treatment system will be required to remove PFAS using those technologies to trace levels. Robust pretreatment will also be necessary for reverse osmosis technology and would be difficult to accomplish at the scale required for wastewater treatment facilities. Reverse osmosis systems are also noted to be very complex and energy in intensive, requiring high operator attention compared to with conventional processes. Pilot or demonstration testing is clearly necessary to confirm process performance, establish design criteria, and identify fouling mechanisms. In many cases, hydraulic profiles will need to be modified and would require intermediate pumping. Spent media or brine disposal will be very expensive, and improper disposal me methods could increase liability risks for public utilities. Work being done by WEF and academia indicates that there are other emerging, emerging technologies that could be effective for PFAS removal. However, Time. these are experimental or not yet commercially available. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, you know, thank you all for keeping to our, our time constraints. Uh, at the very end, if there's a little bit of time, I can ask if there's some follow-up. We'll, uh, we'll see how much time we have left. But also remember, you know, you have the ability to make your comments until January the 29th, and they'll be incorporated in the record. So with that, our next person is Amanda Waters from Aqualaw. Good afternoon. Um, yes, I'm with the firm Aqualaw, and we are representing PVSC on PFOS-related issues. Uh, so this has been an excellent hearing so far, and I want uh, to applaud the council for inviting Colorado. I think we can learn a lot from other states. Um, this is rapidly evolving, so we need to, to have those lessons learned. And I want to reiterate two things that we heard from Meg, and that is that source identification and minimization works, and that we need to support POTWs with industrial pretreatment programs. So you've heard this already that POTWs, we are co-regulators, and we really should be seen as partners in the PFOS battle. So before we jump to, uh, to standards that were, would require the installation of costly treatment plant upgrades, uh, let's find and minimize sources. Uh, I think you all know that investments made to treat PFOS chemicals will ultimately be borne by New Jersey residents and ratepayers, and they're already getting hit with increased rates due to increasingly str stringent regulations. Community affordability is something we all have to consider, um, and you're probably aware the Biden administration has prioritized this. Uh, so before we have requirements uh, that would impose the cost on the public, rather than the industries releasing PFOS, we need to look at environmental justice impacts. So with all this in mind, I respectfully offer the following recommendations. For sampling, drinking water systems, POTWs, and industries that directly discharge the surface water should collect data on their PFOS levels. POTWs are using drinking water methods because, um, as you've already heard, there's no approved method for, for media other than drinking water. And this is not ideal. So when reviewing the results, um, until there's an approved method, we need to keep this in mind. Several states are paying for initial data collection. That's a model that I'd hope DEP would consider. Uh, drinking water system source water, both surface and ground, should be characterized to the extent possible for PFOS levels. We need tracking to identify upstream sources. Where drinking water systems find PFOS chemicals of concern in their raw water, uh, source tracking should be initiated to identify and address upstream sources. If the upstream source is a direct discharging industry, PFOS minimization and its warranted treatment uh, should be implemented. 
where source production will not be sufficient, the drinking water system should carefully identify, pilot, and implement PFAS removal technology. Uh, POTW PFAS minimization plans. While we identify drinking water systems that may require measures to comply with the state's MCLs, we should allow POTWs that discharge above drinking water systems to develop and implement minim minimization plans. Uh, these plans will seek to characterize and minimize PFAS con contributions from non-domestic users, so your uh, industrial users. Um, as part of these minimization plans, characterization of PFAS chemistry of landfill leachate and haul waste may be warranted. Uh, so finally, uh, just a point about we need to invest, but very carefully in water plants to remove chemicals. Uh, where we've identified those impacts, um, we really need to understand what kind of technology is going to be installed. We're finding in other states that some technology is good for short chain, others is good for long chain, and even varies from facility to facility how it works. Uh, so let's make sure we get it right before we require costly upgrades. So I thank you very much for your attention and that completes my comments. Thank you, Amanda. All right, uh, we have Dennis Palmer, AEA next and Landis Sewage Authority. I turned my camera on, I don't see it, but, but I'll go forward from that. Thank you again. My name is Dennis Palmer. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Engineer of the Landis Sewage Authority. I am also a licensed professional engineer and I'm also with the Association for Environmental Authorities. Uh, I'd like to echo the comments by other members about the uh, met no standard methods for that, for this sample. And also, I would also talk about, let's roll out the drinking water testing and possible treating, treatment that's needed. Let's eliminate the PFAS in the source water going to sewage treatment plants. We've always heard there's three most three technologies, basically it's iron exchange, reverse osmosis, and granulated carbon. For our case, looking at both GAC and ion exchange, they're both subject to fouling in a wastewater plant. A wastewater plant is so different than a drinking water plant. Even with disinfection, you still have millions or billions of, of microorganisms going into these reactors, into these filters. They will slime, they will grow, and you'll have problems with just being blinded, and that's a, which will raise the cost for both these, these technologies. Uh, also looking at cost from a an authority. We've been around for over 70 years. We just borrowed 25 million a few years ago to improve our infrastructure and take us out for another 25 years. We already had our engineer look at the cost to put in advanced filtration, microfiltration to take out the biological uh, material and then go into GAC. It's 30 to 43 million. It's 120 to 170 percent increase over our existing debt service. It would be the biggest Boring, we would ever have to do as a public agency. Then you also have the increased O&M cost. If you have exhausted GAC, the extra sludge you have to handle from the microfiltration and all those issues. Uh, it definitely, I'll go into what those costs we expect. Unfortunately, DP has gone on the record that the cost for a wastewater plant is the same as a drinking water plant. That's not true. It's not factual. It's not good in sound engineering or science. Costs are significantly more for a wastewater treatment plant because of biological treatment or removal before you go in. Our facilities go back to 1905. Some of it goes back to 1928. Then we have newer sewer lines from the 1950s to present, as well as our advanced wastewater treatment plant. Any funds that are diverted this time for questionable PFOS and PFOA compliance are dollars that are removed and not used for critical infrastructure needs, provide for reliable, safe wastewater conveyance and treatment, and also be ready for resiliency for storms and outages. Part of our problem, as I see more for our community, is a significant portion of our community is an overburdened community as identified by the new law. And these increased costs will unfairly fall upon those <coughs> least capable of handling those extra costs. If debt service as well as O&M is increased by the numbers I stated, we're looking at a 40 to 45% increase in our user fees. We already experienced about 11% delinquency on our payments and we're concerned of this cost being passed on. I believe, again, go to the source water, go to the water treatment plants. I have a little bit of a rhetorical question to ask. By adding extra facilities to wastewater treatment plant, you're gonna raise the level of the operators needed, the highest level being level four. The problem right now, we have a significant problem with the licensed operators in New Jersey. That is, 
the Board of Examiners for this have only met twice with the COVID restrictions as compared to the PE Board, which has met eight times. There has not been one license issued in the last year or more by licensing by an exam. There was only one exam held last, last year, one. There is literally at this point in time, hundreds, dozens if not hundreds of applications. 30 seconds. Thank you, waiting to be reviewed. These hundreds or if not dozens and hundreds of applications for the license have expired checks that haven't even been cashed by the department. New Jersey has a proud history of having the oldest license program, and right now it's non-existent. The department has spent billions of dollars to build facilities, but hasn't put the resources together to have operators trained, examined, and licensed. We had a meeting scheduled yesterday. It was canceled because there wasn't apparently proper public notice done. At that meeting, we're going to approve the results. Time. Of the that was just held. Thank you for your time. And I'll be submitting written, written result. I'm excuse me, written testimony. All right, thank you very much, Dennis. All right, next up, uh, Michael Wayne from the Hanover uh, Sewerage Authority. If you would like to then make your comments, please. Good afternoon. Hopefully I'm coming through. I can hear your voice. No image though, if you're. Oh, I didn't turn the camera on. Uh, good afternoon. My okay. name is Mike, Michael Wynn. I'm with the uh, Hanover Sewage Authority. I'm the executive director. I'm also a board member of AEA. Uh, in Hanover, we operate a, a 4.6 MGD treatment plant and associated collection system. We're obviously much smaller than some of the other uh, plants, particularly smaller than PVSC. We are one of the uh, limited number of authorities in the state of New Jersey who operate an approved industrial pretreatment program. I'm going to uh, focus my comments on uh, track down studies and the time it might take to implement some of those. When we uh, initially studied IP, whether we should have a pretreatment program, it was an extensive process to track down all of the dischargers in the system and determine who needed permits and what they possibly discharged. For someone who doesn't have a pretreatment program, that could take an extensive period of time to do. Because of our pretreatment program, we maintain uh, very what we feel are, feel are very accurate records of who is connected to our sewer system, what type of business they are in, and what they discharge, particularly if they discharge anything other than domestic wastewater. Uh, because we only serve a, a one town and some limited areas around it, we do have very accurate records. That's a, pro a problem, I would think, for regional authorities or authorities that uh, serve multiple uh, townships. Our initial, uh, we, we've dealt with several th cases where things were tracked down or in dealt with with uh, pollution prevention, um, including when we've changed local limits and we provided a period of time for industries to come into compliance. And some of those requirements were met not by pre-treating their wastewater, it was by eliminating the pollutant of concern. Uh, and we were successful in doing that with our largest discharger, which at the time was a pharmaceutical manufacturer. We've also had two more recent experiences. A number of years ago, we were dealing with detection of silver in our effluent, and we were potentially faced with an effluent limitation from DEP. Because we had some, re some very uh, accurate, re we felt were accurate records, we tracked down anyone we thought potentially could discharge silver. That would be doctor's office, dentists, and at the time, anyone who developed uh, photographic film. And we just, we got that list down to about 15 dischargers. And by working with those 15 dischargers to either have them eliminate their discharge or put in silver recovery, which was helped because silver was as a commodity and is uh, valuable. Uh, we were able to eliminate silver from being detected in our effluent, and we therefore did not have a, a uh, limitation imposed. But those those users who were probably less than 15 of them, uh, they could have cost us and uh, having to upgrade at a cost of tens of millions of dollars. And it didn't seem appropriate that uh, that, that all that a ratepayer should bear that burden. Uh, when it was relatively simple for the people who were discharging the silver to eliminate that and uh, 
solve the problem. Hopefully a similar uh, track down effort would work with PFOS compounds. Uh, the other compound that we were also potentially faced with a limit was mercury, and we were prepared to track that down. And 30 seconds. And we did ultimately defer to DEP's program on uh, dental amalgam. But again, that that by tracking that down and having that source of mercury eliminated or reduced, we were able to not cause uh, the need for a construction of additional treatment facilities and pass those costs on to other our, our current rate base. So uh, admittedly, we have uh, what we feel are very accurate records of who's in our system, which makes tracking down sources easier. And we think that would be an appropriate uh, step to take before imposing effluent limitations. Time. Okay. And I thank you for this opportunity to comment. All right. Thank you, Michael. I uh, appreciate your comments. And, you know, again, thank you everybody for, you know, keeping to our, our time limit. It's important to get everybody's comment in. Thanks again. All right. Maybe we could move on to Dennis Hart and then come back to Robert. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Hi. Since we are submitting written testimony, um, there's so many people speaking today. I'm going to try and keep to the time limit as well as I am. Uh, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, my name is Dennis Hart. I'm the executive director of the Chemistry Council of New Jersey. Prior uh, positions that I've held include uh, director of the Division of Water Quality at the New Jersey DEP, administrator of the Drinking Water and Water Supply Program, assistant commissioner for environmental regulation, and executive director of the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Trust. I think you've heard from uh, comments so far today that there's a lot of uh, of unknown information that needs to be known before setting standards uh, in PFAS. Um, and I'm very concerned about the department's goals so far, particularly as it is already related to the drinking water and the groundwater program remediation program. Commission, uh, Commissioner Lauderette stated in his opening statement that the department's goal was to set reasonable science-based decisions. Um, if that was how the department was implementing the programs, I don't think you'd have many people uh, testifying today, but I'm very concerned when the department seems to be acting like the goal is, and I'll quote a number of people, including uh, Commissioner Lauderette, the goal is to set the most protective numbers in the country, to be less than other states in the country, to be less than the federal government. Um, those aren't goals. Um, those are political statements. Those aren't goals. A, the, the job of a regulatory agency is to be protective and to set protective standards um, based on reasonable science. Of re the, the most protective standard is zero, so there would be no point in anything if you just set zero for everything that we do. Um, so in looking at these numbers, the concerns we have is in our experience with the adoption of the drinking water and the remediation standards, we raised a number of legitimate concerns about unexplained assumptions in the standards development errors and unreasonable assumptions built into the remediation technologies. Um, there has not been in those regulations, and there would need be in all regulations, a financial impact analysis. What is the impact in, on, uh, of setting these standards on treatment technologies? And as we're talking about levels of 10, 11, 7 parts per trillion, the difference in treatment between a standard of, say, seven parts per trillion and 30 parts per trillion could be an order of magnitude cost. And without having the clear, direct uh, answers and the accurate uh, standards being set, we could be directing a great deal of public finance, of public dollars and private dollars for treatment systems that aren't necessary and may not be workable. Thereby doing that, you're actually in the setting standards process, you're taking the decision making authority away from policymakers as to where the state's finances should be spent. If you set limits for PFAS that are so low that the treatment is so exorbitant, you're going to be taking money away from lead removal, lead treatment, things that are actual public health emergencies as we sit here. So, uh, in closing, we want to make sure that the department in adopting standards sticks to the goal that Commissioner Lauderette set out, 
to have reasonable science-based decision-making. And we will be submitting our technical uh, comments uh, in the written record. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Robert Bongiovanni, are you uh, available? And Tony, just real quick, we um, realized we accidentally put some names doubled up on there. Um, so there should be Diane, Eric, and Robert remaining. Okay. Um, so with that, Diane, how you been? Thank you, Tony. Can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Uh, your camera's not on unless you no, want it on. My phone's unstable when I turn the camera on. Um, I want to get to this quickly. My name is Diane Alexander. I'm an attorney at Mara ZD Falcon. I want to thank the DEP and Clean Water Council for convening this hearing to bring stakeholders together to discuss this very significant issue. I serve as counsel or special counsel to water, wastewater, and solid waste authorities throughout New Jersey, and I'm a member of AEA and a member of the AEA board. Track down studies, including source reduction and source control, is an appropriate avenue to begin to address an issue as ubiquitous as PFAS. It is an established and frequently useful way to obtain meaningful data and has produced results in the past in many environmental contexts. It has the benefit of also being a proactive tool in areas where a concern has not yet developed and may identify circumstances before an area of concern develops. In this instance, DEP has undertaken to evaluate the extent of the problem in drinking water through sampling, which is a logical first step. More widespread sampling of potential sources of PFAS should now be undertaken to assist in the characterization of the concern. This is problematic for wastewater dischargers, as there is currently no certified methodology for analysis, but if samples are used for data gathering and not compliance purposes, like process samples, some information can be gathered for informational purposes and further refinement once the analytical methodologies that Virginia Wong spoke of earlier are developed and knowledge of PFAS is also further developed. With information from drinking water and wastewater and other potential sources, areas of concern can be identified and priorities can be established. After that, informed track down studies, source reduction and source control can be undertaken. Site specific source minimization plans can be developed, including the development of TMDLs that Ron talked about earlier, which ensure <laughs> transparent, efficient and effective response. It is difficult to set a universal period of time for this effort. It is a complex pollutant emanating from a whole host of sources. I believe the most appropriate response to the question of what period of time should be given is with due diligence based upon the circumstances. We must proceed swiftly, but with regard to the financial implications of these efforts upon a community's particularly scarce and stretched limited resources, Funding may be needed to assist some areas with this effort. The community and sh stakeholders must be involved and informed of their role and impact upon the concern and its solution. I want to thank you again for this opportunity. Thanks again, Diane. Uh, Robert, are you with us? Robert Bon Giovanni? All right, we'll go down to Eric Benson, Clean Water Action. Yes, hi, Eric Benson, Clean Water Action. Thanks for having us today. Um, in states Thank across you. the country, Clean Water Action is tackling the problem of PFAS pollution. Um, PFAS, uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, also known as forever chemicals because they persist in, in our environment and in our bodies. Um, they're associated with a range of health harms from cancers to liver impacts to reproductive issues. And these forever chemicals are highly persistent and mobile in the environment, which means they bioaccumulate and they travel unchanged through streams, rivers, and other water bodies, including drinking water sources. So um, despite the serious health impacts from PFAS, there are no federal regulations to control these chemicals in surface or drinking water. So states around the country have been adopting their own regulations and policies to protect residents. Uh, there is much New Jersey can and should be doing um, to the maximum extent possible to protect communities and public health 
uh, beyond what we have in place already, starting with uh, requiring PFAS monitoring and or effluent limits in uh, and uh, NIPD, NIPD's permits, um, established numerical water quality criteria for PFAS to protect human health and or wildlife, limit discharges of PFAS into sewage and wastewater treatment plants through an industrial pre-treatment prevention program, um, and evaluate waters impaired with PFAS to set pollution TDMLs. I was glad to hear um, from uh, the participants today about recent programs and initiatives in Colorado. Uh, it's important that we learn from others, which I believe can help expedite New Jersey's process. After this hearing, I'll send a more detailed report of what Michigan has been doing uh, for uh, additional information um, to reduce PFAS and biosolids. But in brief, in 2018, the Michigan Department of Environmental, Great Lakes and Energy uh, launched two initiatives to address PFAS in municipal wastewater, including industrial pretreatment programs. Um, they sought to in investigate a potential for PFAS from industrial sources to pass through wastewater treatment programs, plants, that we wanted to reduce and eliminate significant industrial sources of PFAS to municipal wastewater systems. It was implemented by 94, 95 wastewater treatment plants, 27 were receiving wastewater that violated their water quality standards and or contained PFAS. Uh, they worked with industrial users to implement source reduction and some wastewater treatment plants that are still reporting PFAS releases above water quality standards. Um, the Michigan Department of Environmental and Great Lakes and Energy will likely require permit limits for these w, uh, WTPs. So with New Jersey's well-documented toxic waste legacy and also recent adoption of New Jersey's EJ law and ongoing regulatory process, I think we have additional opportunities and the obligation to further regulate PFAS compounds on a cumulative impacts basis. We must look to use the most protective measures at our disposal as soon as possible. So uh, while New Jersey is currently a leader in the nation, additional PFAS policies are required and in order to fairly protect our communities. So. Um, New Jersey should not wait to go further than we have already. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, back to Robert again, any chance that you can get on at this point? All right, Robert says he's been having uh, some technical problems there. Uh, please then submit your comments to, uh, you know, to our, our council website by January the 29th. All right, one more. If there's one pressing thing that uh, needs to be said, is there one more comment or is that it? Okay, that being said, I want to do the thank yous. Um, to also, you know, our Assistant Commissioner La Tourette, uh, Acting Assistant Com Acting Commissioner La Tourette, also to Virginia, Meg, and Josie. Uh, John Gray and Jennifer Feltis from the department that have been helping us run the show. And also to all you folks, you know, looking at the number of people on here, we were up to 130 or so. And most of you, if you dropped off, most of you hung out till the end. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Please send comments. Really, it's an important topic. We're looking for your comments. Please include them. And thank you very much. Have a great day.